Well, hello everyone. This is another episode of the Canadian Immigration Live Q&A, uh, sponsored by Journey Business Plan and Canadian Immigration Institute. I'm joined by Alicia Beckman Bihari. How are you doing, Alicia? I'm doing all right, Igor. It's been super busy, I think, this week with a number of juggling files and all sorts of interesting developments. So, yeah, I think we've been running around a bit, and Mark is taking a little bit of time. Um, he needs it for himself right now, and he will be back as soon as possible. But we are sending well wishes his way, and we are excited to be here with all of you. And as always, we will uh, send a few shout outs. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, so if you can tell us which city or country you're in, that's always fun to hear who's tuning in from around the world. And we do have some repeat listeners listeners and it's always good to, to see names that are familiar. And I'll just go through a little bit of how this live immigration Q&A works in case it happens to be your first time. G2D2's been here before, VK's been here before, G2D2's in Tunisia, nice to see you. Um, but for this live Q&A, I am an immigration lawyer, Mark is an immigration lawyer, Igor is our articling student, soon to be immigration lawyer. And we are here to try to answer questions and provide high quality immigration legal insight. We're not trying to answer advice type questions. So if you're saying, what should I do? Or, you know, what course of action should I take? Make sure to reach out to us, Whole Immigration Law. You can book a consult. We are happy to talk to you exactly about what's going on in your personal circumstances. But this is really an information sharing so that we tell people what's going on with the rounds of invitations. We bring you news flashes in terms of new programs that are starting up so that a lot of people have high quality immigration legal information and you don't have to rely on chat rooms or sources of information that are suspect and you just don't know if you're getting proper information. So we've got Batman. Uh, Batman's been a repeat viewer from Dallas, Texas. Um, we had Mary Houston. We have Spider-Man again coming to us from Ontario. We've got Crown Supreme from Dubai in the UAE. This is excellent. Uh, we we've got also a... have someone from, so, okay, so Tunisia, Istanbul, Texas, Dubai, one click hill Ontario, uh, Ontario, Winnipeg. Wow, so many people from all over the world. Edmonton. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Heck so Alicia, yeah. what's going to be the main uh, topic that we would want to discuss with our clients before we actually dive to answering the questions? Yeah. So one thing that Igor has been on my mind and your mind, we've been talking about it, we've been doing podcasts, and maybe Igor, you can show people, I just wrote a big blog post on it. And it's a pretty long blog post. But the reason that it's long is because there's a brand new program for Alberta. And we are based in Alberta, Igor and I are in Calgary, and Prem is in Calgary, and Mark is in, in Lethbridge. But we do represent clients from across the country, but we always want to keep tabs on what's happening in Alberta. And so right now there is a brand new Alberta tourism and hospitality stream, and it is going to go live. It is going to launch on Friday, March 1st. So we wanted to try to prepare people to be as ready as possible for this brand new stream, because I know from doing consults, a lot of people are very stuck right now because what happened earlier in February, February 13th, was that the Alberta government announced the complete pause of Alberta AOS, the Alberta Opportunity Stream. And that was kind of the stream that a lot of people were using if they didn't quite have language at CLB7 or if they had a lower tier knock and they had a job offer. So kind of this new hospitality and tourism stream might be filling the gap for some people. But if you happen to be one of these people, it's going to be super important right now to go and start getting your documentation in order, making sure that you have the right knock. So, so far, it it seems that you have to have six months of experience in a tourism and hospitality sector. We don't know if that six months has to be in Alberta, if it can be anywhere in Canada, or maybe it could be even outside of Canada. We're not sure at this point. But six months of experience in a hospitality or tourism type occupation. We did get another news article quoting the 
minister is saying there are specific 18 occupations that will be accepted. So take a look at those knocks at the wage as well so they're listed here and then we did want to talk about if you're looking at a PNP program specifically in Alberta there are five things you should be doing right now because it's super competitive for Alberta so make sure that you have an alberta.ca account and that you have a valid express entry profile if possible because this program might be a subset of Alberta Express Entry. So just kind of like Alberta Tech, they might slide this new tourism and hospitality stream under the Alberta Express Entry stream. And if that happens, you, you need to have a valid Express Entry profile. And then if you're going to submit an application to Alberta PNP, you definitely need to have an alberta.ca account. So the link there is how you go and sign up for that account. You don't already have to be registered or licensed or living in Alberta. You don't have to have a driver's license because you're doing an unverified account. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, make sure that you understand your knock and your wage so that you are properly claiming your work experience. And there's going to be two requirements for this program. Similar to Al other Alberta Express Entry programs, you will need to make sure that you have a job offer from your Alberta-based employer. So this program specifically will need six months in an occupation on the list, and you've got to have proof of those six months, plus forward-looking, you've got to have a job offer going forward from an Alberta employer in the right sector. And so I'm assuming there's going to be something like an NAICS code, just like they have under Alberta Tech for tech industry. They will have a list of acceptable NAICS codes for the employer for the industry of tourism and hospitality. And then every PNP. So this is advice that's really helpful. If anybody is looking for a provincial nominee program, you always have to prove your intention to settle in that province. And so some of the factors that the provinces will look at is, have you gone to school in that province? Have you worked already in that province? Do you have a sibling in that province who's a Canadian citizen or permanent resident? Um, do you have a job offer from an employer based in that province? So si similar things for Alberta as well prove that intent to settle and reside in the province and then whenever there's a brand new program just like when immigration did targeted draws or the category based draws all of a sudden people start looking through their work history and they say well wait a minute do i have six months in a job that fits one of these knocks ever in the last three years for targeted draws for express entry so similar to this new Alberta tourism and hospitality stream you know if you worked as a janitor within the last we're not sure how far back they will look for this experience but if you worked as a janitor and you didn't bother putting it on your visitor visa application to Canada and you didn't bother putting it on your study permit application or your PGWP application and all of a sudden now you're saying oh yeah I worked as a janitor for six months immigration is going to worry about whether you are telling the truth and that could lead to a finding of misrepresentation and a five-year bar for inadmissibility so be super careful if you're applying for either express entry under a targeted stream and you hadn't previously disclosed or you claimed a different knock. Um, be careful about making sure to tell the truth. And if you didn't disclose it before, you better explain why. So these are some things that are happening with, with the programs, with the PNPs, and we wanted to give you an update on that. Take a look at our blog. If you go back to Healthy Immigration Law and you go to our blog, the article's there for, for more details. And as well, we've recorded another podcast episode that will be published very soon. So um, if you're following us on a Spotify or an iTunes, or you can find this episode by going to our website, healthylaw.com, and then you would need to click on uh, blog and resources, and you will see the link to our Canadian Christian podcast where you can check out the episode, which is really helpful. Now, Alicia, if um, if that's okay, then we can probably move to answering the questions from our viewers. I think we have 51 people watching us right now. And as usual, we will start by answering the questions in the order they've appeared. There might be some questions that we might skip if we um, think the question is unrelated to the topic or requires a consultation and we cannot answer the question 
directly in the live stream. So the first question that we will tackle comes from VK and it's about uh, the employment letters. VK is asking if he needs to include all job duties for all positions held in the same company because he was promoted, promoted twice but only was using the work experience from his last job promotion for X percentry. Mm -hmm. So VK, in general, I, I always do recommend that people provide each of their job titles and the duties that were associated with that role and the time that they started, the date they started, and the date they ended in that role. And then when they got the promotion, then, you know, what the title and job duties were, the wage rate for the promotion, and then the next promotion. And the reason that I recommend that people do that and put it all in that one letter from the employer is exactly because of these things like targeted draws. Because sometimes having a, a different knock or potentially classifying your job as a different knock for different time periods could be beneficial to you. Um, so Igor's zooming in on what's required for the letters of reference. And this is also what immigration does recommend, right? So all positions held well employed at the company. So sometimes it means there will be different knocks. So when you actually enter your work experience fields in your express entry profile, you could actually list them as different knocks. Sometimes it's going to be the same knock, but it's promotions within your same knock. It's just your pay categories or your title changes. And it's important to list all of that in the job letter from your employer. And sometimes it'll mean just one block in your work experience field, or sometimes it'll mean a few blocks in your work experience field. Keep in mind, everything you put in your work experience, if you get an invitation to apply and you, f you do an EAPR, that will all result in an upload spot where you have to justify well your work experience claimed and so if you're claiming multiple periods of other high skilled work experience and you have one letter you could put the same letter for each of those three upload spots so as long as all details are in the letter and you're sure that you're encompassing all your high skilled work then that's going to be important for you to list and it's the way that you should do it so that immigration has all the proper details. Right. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. And this one is rather interesting. So Mary is asking if we can actually use some um, tricky calculation to predict the ITA uh, score, minimum score required for an ITA for francophones, if we take the immigration targets announced by the RCC for the year and then we divide it by the number of months and then we would have an average number of the ITAs that francophone should receive in a month and then for example if the number of an ITA issued to the francophones would be lower in January would that mean that in February they will invite more francophones what is so your take on it Alicia yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, they have the targets. And so every year immigration publishes kind of their breakdown of what they are targeting for economic categories. And then within the economic category, they kind of break it down by provincial nominee programs, express entry, um, other programs like the Rural Northern Immigration Program. So they have breakdowns for each of those categories. Then they have overall the targets for, for how many francophones they want to have as a percentage of that mix. The tricky thing is, is those things overlap, right? You could be a francophone and a PNP, or you could be a francophone and express entry, or a francophone and an RNIP applicant. Um, so when immigration's doing these category-based draws, we don't have the insight into their system to see how they um, are allocating their nominations or their invitations to apply across their uh, demographic fields. So maybe, maybe Mary, maybe you can say on average, this is how much they do per month, but 
it's probably not broken down into a monthly requirement. It's probably they're looking at the whole year and then they're saying our overall percentage, what we want to have for francophones is this percentage and therefore across all of our service lines of delivery, that's what we're going to get. Um, we do know, of course, that there was the Im immigration minister was announcing that those francophone targets are even higher than what we had thought that they were going to be and they were exceeding those targets. And so it has never been a better time to be a francophone than now. Um, it is a huge leg up in terms of your probability or likelihood of getting an invitation to apply, because not only does it give you a chance at those targeted draws, it also amps up your overall CRS score by a significant factor. Okay. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I see that we have two super chats, one from VK, and I think Vicky, we've answered your question, unless you have any other questions. Oh, he actually has one. Uh, what was my experience with CELPIP tests? Uh, was it difficult? Well, it really depends on your level of English and how well you are prepared for the test. Uh, we do have um, a series of live, live streams that we do with CELPIP instructor Brandy Rob. The next one is scheduled for tomorrow. So I highly recommend that you come and join the live stream. It's going to be at... If I'm not mistaken, it should be at 10 a.m. Um, yes, 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So about the same time as we were supposed to start this live stream. Um, so highly recommend you go there. Uh, we already had one session where we talked in general about the test. And now we're going to have four sections, four live streams tackling each section uh, specifically. So... Um, that would be really helpful. But in terms of the tests, there are some things that I don't like about CELPIP, and I have to be honest. Um, Brandy, please forgive me for saying this, but there are some things that I don't agree with <laughs> in terms of how they uh, make this test run. Um, for example, um, when it comes to the listening section, you do take notes and you don't see the questions as you listen to the text uh, for the audio. On IELTS, uh, during the IELTS exam, you will see the questions as you're listening to the recording so that you can actually identify the keywords. You may be highlighting things um, in your questions, and you know exactly what you will be asked later on after the recording. In CELPIP, you don't. Uh, another thing that might not work for you when you're taking the CELPIP test is, for example, if you're not comfortable um, talking to a mic, speaking into like a computer, uh, maybe that is not the right test for you and you're better off taking IELTS, for example, speaking to a live person. Uh, but again, just give it a try and uh, potentially attend all of the live sessions that we have with Brandy. Uh, they will be bi-weekly sessions and maybe by the end of the, um, of the series of these live streams, you will make up your mind and give it a try. Alicia, we do have one more super chat from Marco, so I'll pull this up. Um, great content and channel. Thank you, Marco. Even though I was born in Canada, this channel does a great job of providing concise information versus what the media provides. Thank you so much. I thought that was a question. That was just a comment and a super chat. Thank you so much. Very kind comment. All right, so let's uh, scroll down through the uh, questions that we received from the viewers. The next one is from Nana, and she's asking, uh, what are your chances of getting your study permit approved when you receive the medical request and your eligibility stage is complete? Oh, so, Nana, the fact that they've processed your medical is good. It means that the file is proceeding along as long as the medical is passed and as long as all of the things that made up your study permit application check out in terms of, you know, was it a DLI? Were you approved for your program? Was there a logical connection between your prior program of studies and this program of studies? Do you have a strong temporary intent? Can you prove that you've got connections to your home country? Can you prove a study plan, right? What was the reason that you picked Canada? Were there other schools that you could have gone to? Um, why was this program important for your career progression? So those are all things that immigration officers consider when they're looking at study permits. They also look at your language test results. So those CELPIP marks, those IELTS marks, if you don't have kind of around a CLB six or seven for most of your language fields, a study permit approval gets harder and harder. In my experience, that's what I've seen with clients. 
So language is a strong factor of people's ability to do well in a Canadian study permit program. The other thing that they sometimes look at are your marks your marks from your first degree or prior education. And if you've got lower marks in your program of studies, then that might mean that mm, they're a little bit worried about whether you're going to do well in this Canadian program of studies. Um, financial ability to support yourself, that's a big one as well. And of course, we've seen fluctuations with immigration's requirements about proving settlement funds or ability to support yourself for the study permit program because cost of living has gone up and it's difficult for students to find places that are affordable. So these are all things that they've they will consider based on your prior study permit application. You're probably one of the lucky ones because you managed to squeak your study permit application in before the rules all changed and now people have to have not only a letter of acceptance from their school but also these provincial attestation letters which we don't have yet and should be developed sometime before the end of March. Um, but right now there's a pause on all study permits unless you're doing a graduate level uh, master's or a PhD. So you're one of the lucky ones that managed to squeak your application in. If you think that there are deficiencies in your application, I would encourage you to add information to your study permit before you get a decision, right? You can go in and try to add information through the new web form um, to try to, to speak to some of those things if you didn't actually justify temporary intent and your study plan and, and why you're a good fit for the program. So it's difficult to say on what your chances are. It, it really depends on the specifics of what you put in your application and how it fits with your career progression and your education progression. Right. Alicia, as you were answering this question, I realized Apparently, <laughs> when it came to answering the super chat, so we have the super chat from VK with the um, pink icon, and then apparently we have another VK with the landscape. <laughs> and I think I maybe missed the question from the VK who sent um, the super chat. So VK, um, I don't see your question. So if you can write the question in the chat, um, that would be really helpful. Um, I don't see your question. I cannot find it anywhere. Um, okay, perfect. So um, that is the side note. <laughs> we'll come back to the questions. Uh, the next one was from Bernice. Um, so Bernice says, uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Alicia and Igor. I was wondering if you had any insight about the charity exemption for LMIA. I work for a charity in a frontline worker role and I was wondering if I can apply for a closed work permit. The mm -hmm. eligibility for this program would need to be assessed in a specific, um, in your specific situation. So we'd need to know what exactly do you do, what company you work for. Alicia, are there yeah. any other details that you need to know to make an assessment? Yeah, so Bernice, Religious workers, the exemptions for religious workers are very complex. So there's there's business visitor exemptions. So religious workers could come here as a business visitor on an exception to the LMIA, and they could get a work permit based on that. But you are significantly restricted in terms of your ability to use that work experience for any further pathway to PR. Some charities and religious organizations will be able to sponsor an LMIA for a religious worker, but usually where the rubber hits the road is what is the wage that that company charity is willing to pay. Um, and this is a very specific, complex area in terms of religious workers under LMIA exemptions versus having an LMIA and, and making sure that you've got some sort of pathway to PR because of that. Um, so for sure, book a consultation or have your organization, the charity, book a consultation. Um, we don't tend to do very many of the religious workers because it's very specific. So if you are able to find an immigration lawyer who specializes in doing these charity worker, um, actual religious worker work permits, that is something that's probably going to be your best bet because there are a lot of wrinkles and it is fraught with difficulties in terms of your pathway to permanent residence. Often the charity won't be able to pay the median wage rate um, on the job bank for that role and that's often where there's a problem with the LMIA route. Okay, 
perfect. Uh, one thing that I want to share once again um, is we see the question, um, we see an update from VK and VK, for some reason, your question doesn't show up. Maybe your question is too long. Um, I can see the list of questions that we receive from you and your messages, but there are no question in between. So maybe um, just try to ask, rephrase the question and make it shorter. Maybe that is the reason why we don't see it. Um, in the meantime, let's keep uh, plugging through the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, the next question was actually from Vida. And Vida is asking, uh, any idea if the upcoming Alber um, if the upcoming Alberta Tourism Hospitality Stream is under Express Entry or not? Mm -hmm. And Vida, we don't know. At this point, we don't know. They haven't said. Um, so it's possible that they could com completely create another stream category and they can say, oh, we have a standalone Alberta Tourism and Hospitality and here are the program eligibility requirements. Maybe. Or they could potentially slide it in under the Alberta Express Entry Stream. So they could say all the regular Alberta Express Entry Stream requirements apply, and it's going to be a subcategory, kind of like we have a dedicated healthcare pathway and we have the Alberta Tech Stream within and kind of underneath the umbrella of the Alberta Express Entry Stream. It's probably easier for them to slide it in under Alberta Express Entry, except for the fact that you have some low tier NOx. And so you wouldn't be able to qualify for potentially for CEC um, with those lower NOx. So maybe they will have to take it out and do a separate application stream under its own program. So right now we don't know. They will tell us on Friday, but take a read of my blog to try to prepare just in case, because um, we're not sure which way they'll go at this point. Okay. Then we have the question from Tuhin. He says, moving to BC soon with the job. If I collect my work reference letter, watching for eight years of experience for BC and PNP from my current US employer, with mentioning the last day of work, will that be okay? So in general, it's it's tough when you're transitioning, right? When you're moving from one job and then you're coming to another place. And so if you have an anticipated last day, then that can be on the letter, right? You can say with an anticipated end date of X. Um, and then what you'll do is, of course, back it up with a pay stub that shows your last pay period was X. So that's probably the way that you can go. You definitely want to have your start date. Just like we talked about earlier, you want to have broken out into if you've been there for eight years you've probably changed roles within those eight years or potentially changed roles so make sure that you have each of those roles if your pay period and job duties and job description or job title are significantly different you want to have all those broken out and then the anticipated end date okay. Alicia this is this is funny this is going to be the funniest live stream ever we have a third week <laughs> <laughs> somebody's doing it on purpose Oh my goodness, that's funny. <laughs> All right. Okay, so thank you, VK, for the super chat. Uh, we'll move back to the list of questions. This one is from John Snow. Oh my goodness, guys, where do you... <laughs> How do you come up with those names? Batman, Superman, John Snow, <laughs> three VKs. That's so funny. Okay. Oh, and then we have Captain Phillips, but we'll get to Captain Phillips later. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's funny. Okay, so John Snow is saying, I'm working as a lawyer in India. If I gain work experience in healthcare as a part-time worker, for example, pharmacy assistant, can I put my full-time work in the personal history and can I use six months work experience for FSW and that there is a qualifier? Both work will be simultaneous. So yeah, so John's trying to, to get the benefit of those targeted occupation draws. Um, so the only trick with all this is that immigration is only going to count a maximum of 30 hours per week in any given job. So you can't stack jobs and then get extra credit for additional work anything above 30 hours. But it's interesting because I had a consult about somebody in a similar situation who was looking to see whether they would be eligible for a targeted draw 
if they happen to be under study status in Canada. And there doesn't seem to be anything disqualifying a person from those six months, as long as the six months were within the last three years of time, and you can properly substantiate this. So theoretically, John, if you were able, yeah, so baby Igor, if you go to the healthcare draw, and then you click on the instruction, and if you click on the MIs, um, are you under the MIs right now? Um, so let's see. Yeah, so here are the ministerial instructions. And then if you go to specifically the healthcare draw, so if you go to 284, yeah, and then click on that. And then this is the list of the ministerial instructions. So what happens is that Express Entry has a general list of ministerial instructions, but then the targeted draws, each targeted draw has a specific ministerial instruction. So if you read this, and it's too small on my screen probably to read out, but it gives you the list of occupations. And if you go up, Igor, it says a member of the category. So section three sub one, is what are the requirements for a member of the category and as long as you can show within the three-year period immediately preceding when the category was established you have accumulated over a continuous period at least six months of full-time work experience or the equivalent in part-time work so you've got to show six months continuous you can't have breaks in those periods of employment in one of the occupations listed you have to do the lead statement and you've got to do the majority of the main duties and the only thing it says is that despite subsection one an eligible foreign national is not a member of the category um, established in section two if the work experience described was not accumulated within the three-year period so basically they're only saying three years. I have never had, Jon Snow, a situation where somebody was working as a full-time lawyer and then they were working the equivalent of six months full-time over uh, within the last three-year period. But theoretically, it might count. We, I, I've never seen that situation, um, but there's nothing in the ministerial instructions that says it's not allowed, you would probably not get credit for both jobs in terms of your foreign skilled worker points for um, for work experience, but you might not need it because you might already have your full three years of foreign work experience points. Right. And Alicia, so here Jon Snow will be working as a part-time worker. So six months of a part-time work would not qualify. You would need at least one year to accumulate an equivalent yes. of six months full-time work experience. Correct. Yeah. And then um, putting the um, work experience as a lawyer in India in a personal history, um, when you think about doing that, you need to always remember that to meet the minimum eligibility requirements for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, you have to have one year of continuous full work, um, full-time work experience. And so you would need to include at least some part of that work experience in your uh, work history. And and verify it with the reference letter or any other supporting documents. Because unless you have a one year of work experience claimed in the work experience section, you will not be meeting the FSW requirements. Yeah, and Igor, I mean, we would have to, John, we'd have to talk with you. So book a consult. Right. We'd have to take a look at how you've set up your profile. But theoretically, you could have it all listed in your work experience. You wouldn't have to move anything to your personal history as long as you can justify each of those periods. And then specifically in your letter of, of explanation state, you're only claiming X period of years for your foreign work experience, you're meeting minimum eligibility, and then you're hopefully meeting your targeted requirements as a pharmacy assistant as long as over a period of a continuous one year you can show every week you have at least 15 hours to add up to an equivalent of 30 hours within a year within the last three years but it becomes fairly complex but this might be a strategy so make sure to book a consult Right, so we move on to the next uh, person in the live stream, Captain Phillips. Congratulations on getting the passport request. But Captain Phillips is at the sea, just as Captain should be. So Captain Phillips will be in the sea for the next three months at least. And so his question is, how does he ask RSC for the extension? Mm -hmm. And so... 
we had a very similar question from somebody who was SC and who got their passport request on on a live stream a couple of weeks ago. And take a look, um, Igor. I don't know if you can do that. Secure CIC.GC.CA client contact forward slash ask about or update your application. But make sure to go to the we call it the new web form and just tell immigration, say, look, here's my ship manifest or here's my log showing that I am scheduled to be working. I don't have a port where I can go back to to mail my passport up until this date. And then you're going to um, basically go to this and say, add a document to your application. And you're going to tell immigration where you are um, and just ask for an extension ask for a particular time which is when you will be back on land and we will we'll be able to mail your passport in once you're done your shift um, and provide some sort of supporting documentation from your employer to prove that we you know you never know if immigration is going to actually accept that or they're going to just say too bad so it's always a risk but the best you can do is ask for that extension and if you don't hear back from immigration once you've submitted this follow up with phone calls and and really stay on it to try to see what's going to happen um, because you know it's it's a tough situation if you're worried about jumping ship literally losing your job or trying to get your pr finalized so it's a, for sure a tough situation and hopefully they will give you a reasonable extension of time as long as you can prove it but you want to follow up and ask them to see whether they have approved the extension. Right. Okay. So we have a big win. Now the question from VK came through. So VK says, submitted all documents for uh, post ITA EAPR, got an acknowledgement of receipt. Uh, per latest timeline, in what sequence RSSC will notify me and what are the next steps? So by metrics, medicals, etc. Mm -hmm. So, the timeline isn't necessarily always proceeding the same for every applicant. So, when you look at your page, when you log back into your GC key account and you look at your submitted application and it'll show your express entry there, um, it's going to have a number of little markers, right? It's going to say um, application received, it's going to say whether biometrics are requested and if they are then there's going to be a biometric information request letter, so a BIL that's going to pop up in your portal. Um, same thing for a medical instruction letter, that, that MIL will pop up in your profile. They should send you an email to your email account so that you go and you log on and you check. There's really short timelines usually on the biometrics and the medicals where they usually only give you 30 days. So you want to be on top of that. They will pause the processing of your application until they get the biometrics or the medical results. So it's in your best interest to go and get that done as soon as possible. Um, sometimes people do the biometrics, they do the medical. Those are normally the first things that happen. And then things get stalled out in terms of security and background check clearances. And sometimes that never properly gets updated if you do the application tracker or even in the account. So sometimes all of a sudden there's just a result that comes in. And sometimes there will be a request for further information, an additional document request. Those you always have to be wary of if they ask you for an updated um, Schedule A, a 5669 form, be very wary because it means that something's not adding up in your file for them. And it could be that they're trying to pin you with misrepresentation. So um, hopefully you don't get an additional document request and hopefully they just continue on with the security and the background clearances. Right. Okay. The next question would be from Mano. He says, when the application tracker shows eligibility completed, what does that mean? Yeah. Igor, do you have insight into this? Do you want to tackle that? I mean, basically, there's the application tracker and then there's your GC key portal status. And um, ideally, in a perfect world, both of those would say the same things and be updated at the same time. But it seems like there's not always... Um, mirroring sometimes there's a disconnect sometimes the portal will say one thing and the application tracker will say will say another so an eligibility completeness in general maybe igor you can pull up the a11.2 completeness check so 
this is the stage that officers will look at to see whether the minimum requirements under the legislation under Section 11, Sub 2 of the Immigration Refugee Protection Act have been met. And so if those have been met, then the application can continue to be processed based on substantive um, merits. But if you can't get past the eligibility completeness check, you're kind of dead in the water. That's the end of the game and they will send back your application as being incomplete. So it's a good thing if eligibility is completed, it means that you've passed the basic completeness check. Here's, here's the page that you would want to read carefully through. What, mm -hmm. what does it mean to have a complete application? Yeah. So this is what officers are double checking to make sure that all the key details of your application are present and all the supporting documents are there. And the next question is from Pep Needs. Can we apply for visitor record while being in implied status in Canada? Um, so Pevneet, this sounds like a little bit of a complex situation. You've got to be careful that you don't fall out of status. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that your implied status means that you're trying to apply for a work permit and switching categories from one work permit to another, but maybe you're on implied status on a visitor record as well, um, or a study permit or something else. But if you're saying that you were on a work permit and then you switch to a different category of work permit and you're on implied status to be able to work and you're not sure whether that application will be approved, sometimes what people do is they do submit a, a visitor record application kind of in the alternative in case their work permit extension gets refused. And the reason you'd want to do that is that your visitor status is kind of your backup plan. In case the work permit's re refused, you can at least prove that you have some way to support yourself without working illegally in Canada and you have some plan for how long you want to stay here under visitor status. You you can usually ask for visitor status while you're waiting for your work permit determination. Um, depending on your country of origin, you might need to get another visitor visa, right? So visitor status and visitor visa are two different things. So a visitor visa is a counterfoil in your passport. Um, if you are from a country that is visa exempt, meaning you just need an electronic electronic travel authorization. Just make sure your electronic travel authorization is also up to date. It's going to be tied to your passport. But yes, if you need a new visitor record, you've got to actively make an application for your visitor status to be renewed so that you have the ability to stay physically present in Canada. If for some reason they refuse your work permit application before you get that visitor record, you might fall out of status and you will have to do a restoration application as long as it's within 90 days of when you originally had status. This is a fairly complex area, so please book a consult if you have questions. But in general, um, sometimes people will file a visitor record extension in the meantime as a backup in case the work permit gets refused. Right. Okay, let's move on to the question from Purat. I'm an international um, grad student in Canada and a French speaker, and I have work experience from outside Canada. What's the best program for permanent residents? Uh, this would be the question that would urge me to take the triangle and make the triangle sound, uh, the bell sound, which means that we need to know more details about you. Um, choosing the program is not like choosing a car, whether you buy a Kia or a Toyota. Um, it's, it's not like one program is better than the other. It's what programs you qualify for. So to know whether you have a chance of getting an ITA through the federal expert century Canadian experience class or federal skilled worker program, you need, we need to know whether you meet the minimum eligibility requirements and then how high you rank in the pool. Because you may, you may be eligible for the federal skilled worker program, but your scores would be like 350, then obviously that would not be possible right now for you to get an ITA unless you qualify for some category um, that is designed uh, by RCC, like healthcare or, or trade or uh, agriculture. And so to know whether you actually do have any chance, we need to know more details. We do have one more similar question. Uh, let's see. This one is from Beatrice. So the 
question is, my husband has been working in Canada, Nova Scotia for one year now under a low-wage temporary foreign workers. He is about 55 years old. What options are available to him to apply for permanent residence? There are just so many more questions that we need to ask to actually tell you exactly. Um, from looking right now at it, um, 55 years old would most likely make you a um, not a good candidate for the federal skilled worker program because the with each year after 29 you you lose five points, so you would have lost quite a few points by now. But that being said, again, category based draws could be your uh, golden ticket if you have work experience in a specific occupation that is. Um, in demand in Canada, there is a possibility that um, you can get an ITA even with a lower score. Alicia, yeah, and, and Igor, I'll just add to that that, of course, um, Nova Scotia has a PNP program and there's also the Atlantic Immigration Program. And those are programs that a lot of people um, have had success with because the Atlantic provinces want to retain their workers. Um, but most of those programs, be careful because most of them are employer sponsored. So you have to make sure that you have an employer who will continue to employ you. and. Um, low skilled are, or low wage is, is difficult. Um, it depends if it's a high skilled low wage or if it's a low wage, low skill job. And so those are all considerations in terms of what programs you might be eligible for. But please reach out, book a consult, or you can also look specifically at an immigration lawyer who's located in Nova Scotia because they will have insight into all the peculiarities of their Nova Scotia PNP program specifically. Right. And then very similar answer would go to uh, Santosh, who says, currently uh, holding an H-1B work permit and received a job offer in Alberta. Could you please advise on the possibilities of obtaining permanent residence? Again, that really depends on what occupation you're working in. Um, as, you, as you may have heard, the Alberta Opportunity Stream is now paused, and most likely this program will be resumed, but it will undergo significant changes. And we have... No idea at this moment how big those changes are going to be. Uh, we already know about the new stream for hospitality and tourism. If you work in the occupation that relates to hospitality and tourism, maybe that would be a golden ticket. Alternatively, maybe accelerated tech pathway um, if you have an expert entry profile. But those are the options that we need to, um, we actually need to just know more details about you um, before we can give you any um, solution. Speaking about the X percentry draws, just right now, um, I've received a notification that there was a new draw, Alicia. The yeah. CRS was 534, and RCC issued 1,470 invitations, and that was a general draw. So let's take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just pull this up. Okay, yeah, no kidding. The new round of invitation happened just right now. Is it possible that we have someone from the live stream who has 534 and above? <laughs> Tie-breaking rule was January 16th, 2024. So if you had exactly a CRS of 534 and you didn't get your profile created until after January 16th at 3.51 UTC time, then you will have missed out. But if you manage to have a profile at exactly 3.534 or above and you've had your profile valid and active um, since before January 16th of this year, then you should hopefully be looking at an ITA coming into your inbox within the next 24 to 48 hours. Alicia, I am a visual person. Sometimes I wish the RCC would have a web page where you have certain buckets, you know, and then you can see how full the bucket is, knowing how many applicants they actually collected from each bucket. For example, if that's a category uh, based draws, we would know, like, oh, there's the allocation. We've got so much, you know, and then. Wouldn't that be so much easier for all people? Like just yeah. having this visual tool would be so, so cool. Yeah, um, yeah but congratulations to those people who uh, meet the eligibility requirements for these draws. Um, 
534, 534. Um, pretty high score. We do have a couple of clients who are waiting for the ITA with the lower score, so not a good day for them, but uh, maybe a good day for someone else. Okay, let's move on. The next question is from Adrian. Um, Adrian says, I just finished my one-year program last December. Um, haven't applied for post-grad work permit yet. I'm applying, planning to enroll in September for another certificate program. Can my open work permit children maintain their status in Canada if I apply for a study permit? Okay, so Adrian, probably you're going to need to book a consult as well because there's a lot of moving parts here because also I don't know what kind of study permit you're applying for, right? Keep in mind that there's a pause on study permits until we get those provincial allocation letters, so nobody can submit them until after March. And so I don't know um, if you're trying to do program stacking or not. So if you've applied for your PGWP, you're not going to be able to get the eligibility of program stacking. So. It is sometimes possible if you complete two programs without a gap in between them and it's kind of back to back, you can kind of stack a one year program with another one year program, be able to combine the two of them as long as they're all from DLIs and they're eight months at least in duration and it's accredited schools, then you can ask for both of those programs to be considered as a two year program. And then only after the second program, you apply for your PGWP and you would ask for a three year PGWP if you finish two eligible one year back to back programs. If you apply for a PGWP right now, at best, you can only get a one year PGWP. So even if you went back to school to study, you're going to be missing out on your eligibility to gain Canadian high skilled work experience if you're on a full time study permit. So you don't want to be doing those two things at the same time. You don't want to be letting your PGWP run out and be going back to school full time on a study permit. It doesn't make sense for your ability to gain points for express entry. Um, Book a consult, we can talk about it more. If you apply for another study permit, maybe it's at a master's level and maybe you don't have to worry about the allocation letters. If you are the principal applicant on the study permit, your spouse and kids should be able to get extended permits, but I'm worried about you burning up your PGWP and not being able to claim Canadian high skilled work experience. Because keep in mind that yes, you could work if you have a study permit, there's nothing against it if you have a study permit and a work permit, but for express entry, you cannot get Canadian work experience points if you hold full-time study permit status. It just doesn't count. So I don't want you to be burning your PGWP. Right. Alicia, as our time runs out, um, we probably will have to skip through most of the questions and I'll just scroll all the way to the bottom as we're wrapping things up. Uh, one question from 1T explained was when Ontario attestation letters will be issued and then I love this response this question about attestation not even Mark Miller knows the answer isn't that the best yeah. answer <laughs> yeah and there was um, there was actually a, a couple news articles where they had done access to information and privacy requests. I don't know if you saw that article yesterday, Igor, but um, they had done access to information and privacy requests and they were looking at which schools mm -hmm. were the ones that were getting the majority of the study permits. And um, most of those were not private institutions. Most of those were public institutions and they were colleges and, and they were all in Ontario. I think maybe one of them was not in Ontario, but the list of the top was all in Ontario. And so I think there's a little bit of a, a tempest going on in Ontario right now about what's going to happen with those number of allocations overall for the province and then how that gets divided up between the schools in Ontario. So. Very good question, and yes, we we definitely don't know yet. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to quickly find this article if I can do it. Yeah, I think I found it. Uh, let me just share the screen. Yeah, so we have the list of schools. Conestoga College had 30,000 per, um, study permits approved, which is crazy. So you can see the top top 10 schools nine of them are in Ontario. 
And if you scroll down, Igor, on the article, they also compared historically um, how many study permits over the years. You can kind of see the progression of, of how things have been shifting. Yeah, so they've, they've got a few graphs and a few stats here on how things have changed over the years. So interesting data that they are pulling out. And I think as of yesterday, the, the minister hadn't responded to comment on that. So we'll see. Yeah. I thought I, I saw many students from Seneca College, but now looking at Conestoga, I'm like, wow, that is like three mm -hmm. times more, mm -hmm. which is crazy. All right, so that will be it for today. Um, sorry for all those viewers who submitted their questions, but we just didn't get enough time to answer through all of those. Uh, we tried to answer some questions and provide enough details so that the answer is not just... Uh, um, just to say, yeah, you know, we answered the question. We want to provide you with actual details and maybe dive into specifics, sh share the screen. So it takes a little more time. But um, we will see you next week, as usual, on Wednesdays. Uh, today we had a little delay, so we had to start at 10.30. Next week, hopefully, we will begin, um, as usual, at 10 a.m. Mountain Valley time. Again, for those who are wondering about the SALPIP test, uh, tomorrow we'll be doing another live stream um, at 10 a.m. with Brandy Robb, a instructor for CellPip. We also highly encourage you to go to our website, holstylaw.com, and check the latest blog post about the new uh, hospitality and tourism stream in Alberta. And as usual, um, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, uh, leave comments, and uh, share this video with someone who might benefit from the information that we've shared. And alternatively, if you don't have enough time to connect with us for the live stream, uh, you can always subscribe to our podcast where we share uh, the insights on Canadian immigration and we talk in detail about the changes uh, to Alberta Opportunity Stream and the new hospitality and tourism stream in Alberta. Well, thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye -bye. Thank you, Igor.